Hi, are we are we live? We're Morning. live. Looks Welcome, like we're live. Everyone. Thanks for, we're live. Thanks so much for calling in. Kylie, beautiful to see you in your uh, congrats on your brand new office. So I thought we'd do something different this year. I had a feeling that nobody is interested in, in me run through a PowerPoint on, on seven predictions about the tech scene, because look, we're all living and breathing it every day. So I thought one of the more interesting things, and this is a perennial debate that Kylie and I have, is is you know what what is what is the differences in the journey that we have both taken? You know, I'm a serial founder and Kylie is a serial investor. And Kylie and I have actually known each other for 10 years. And I think Kylie, you're telling me that yeah. this, is, this month is actually the 10 year anniversary of that person. Although Kylie, do you want to kick yeah. it off and share kind of when we first met, what's the first thing we did together? And then we both started out as serial entrepreneurs and then our path started to go yeah. into different directions and kind of what we've seen and learned from those yeah, different yeah. journeys over time. No, I think I think it's a this, this is a, when this is a very funny topic because when you first approached me about it, um, I mean this is just for the audience, right? Where tuning in, like when Patrick first approached me about this topic, I was like, wow, hey, what what do we what do we learned ten years, right? January, so I'll take us back ten years to the beginning when I first met Patrick. Okay, we'll start there and then we'll plot it out. This was January twenty eleven. Um, so I had just had a company that I founded called Group Smore get acquired by Groupon, right? And uh, and Patrick was uh, building a similar company called Dealmates at the time. And for some reason, we met at a Mind Valley's office. They were having some party or something. And, you know, it, and it'd be the first time I would meet Patrick. And so we, uh, there was a bar downstairs, you know, I was walking out and I happened to be Huiling, the, the co-founder of Grab, uh, and back then called My Taxi at the time. So we were at that event. We're trying to hire programmers at the time. That's what I remember, right? We're trying to like, Build up my techie team at the time. Anyway, so we went downstairs and saw Patrick and we had a chat. It was it was crazy because that was exact almost 10 years ago. Just think about it. And I think Patrick, like you mentioned, that you have um not not only like we, we started just building companies, like you built your companies, I built my companies, like you built many companies. Um but what happened afterwards was that I went into venture capital. You know, we went no, no, we we first built another company together first, and then we started digressing, right? We started doing different things. So the first thing we did together, uh, you and I was um the media company, uh, Rep Asia, right? So I had built a company called sales.com and um and I came to your office afterwards, a few months afterwards, right? And I said, Hey, look, um, I want to find a way to get this company to be much bigger. I want to list this company. You have done so many IPOs. How do you do it? I remember I came to the office and I sought your advice. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I do. I do. And I remember you impressed me because you're the first person that's come to a meeting with me asking for advice on how to IPO and you came in shorts, which, which at the time was a very <laughs> rare thing for entrepreneurs to wear. Hey, this is a hot country, man. Like, you know what I mean? It's like we're all living on the equator. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I remember I went to you and I was like, okay, you know, um, how, we, we want to do something bigger. And, and it's so interesting. Interesting because like I, I remember that you were so fast moving and you so pissed in of your ideas. Um, within one year from that conversation, we managed to get um, sales.com merged with some Hatches assets. We 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 baked it into um, a, a, a reverse IPO, if you will, and then we went out to acquire other media companies. And eventually, that company got sold to the public entity itself. Got sold to Media Prima, uh, and Media Prima paid half of all the cash it had to buy our company. Right. So I thought that was a very very fun ride together. But what happened afterwards and us kind of like uh, reflecting on our careers in tech and the tech ecosystem was interesting because not only did you go on to build companies as a serial entrepreneur, but you did it very differently. That's what I always found very fascinating. It's like you always kind of like, you know, you, you, you didn't like some of the ideas, you didn't start it from zero. Although iFlix, I would say, is one of those that you did kind of like start from scratch. You know, some of them like you came in mid game to kind of pull things together. And for me, like I went onto my venture capital career, but I did it too. Like with 500 startups, like what I did was that, hey, let's invest in many, many seed stage companies. Let's build portfolios of a minimum of 100 companies per portfolio and go at it as, as a diversified approach to investing in tech and to build sectoral diversification within each fund as opposed to concentrated vehicles where you sit on their boards and you kind of have a little bit more control and kind of like a, you know, take a very active position within a company, you know, like we would be more supportive, um, supportive folks from the early days uh, and, and invest in many, many companies. So being a serial uh, entrepreneur in your way, myself being a serial investor in my way, 
we kind of fast forward and we've seen like the rise of a, a, a ton of amazing companies in Southeast Asia. But I wanted to ask you, Patrick, like what did you look back? Did you regret anything? <clears throat> what, what, were there moments of doubts where you felt that you should have become a VC? You know, <clears throat> did you feel that you would have wanted to do something different in the past 10 years? Like, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, I never, I never have regret, right? Because it's, it's just not a word that I believe that people should have. But I mean, there's definitely lots of learnings along the way. And you know, I chose to be, you know, when, when, when Kai and I built that company together and sold it, you know, there was a moment of reflection where I go, do I do the typical entrepreneur thing and who's exited their company and become a VC? And when I saw that, you know, Kylie, this is this is a guy from Asia, all of a sudden became one of the most powerful guys in 500, you know, 500 is not a Southeast Asian VC firm. It is a global VC firm that is, and the 500 brand is strong in pretty much every country in the world. And here was Kylie, um, you know, a successful entrepreneur from Malaysia that had now become one of the biggest seed investors in the world. So I sat and I go, wow, what a, what an awesome journey. And, and I thought, you know, could I do the same? Could I be a VC? And I think in the end, you know, my partner, Luke and I decided, you know, we, we, we're not going to make good VCs, we're, we're going to be better um, entrepreneurs or better supporters of other entrepreneurs and taking a more concentrated approach. And so that's what we ended up doing. You know, we, we now have, say, seven or eight companies in our portfolio, whereas Kylie has has something like 2,000 companies in the portfolio. So in the end, I kind of, kind of the similarities are we're both in tech, both big, big believers in the internet is disrupting everything. We're both big, big believers in backing great entrepreneurs. I think the difference is we said, hey, let's back less than 10 entrepreneurs or as Kylie's gone, hey, let's go for scale and let's back multiple entrepreneurs. And the funny thing is when you ask me kind of what 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 regrets or, I mean, not regrets, but I mean, I'll tell you some of the interesting opportunities, you know, that we've come across here. I still remember sitting on a flight with Anthony from Grab where we both were on the same flight to Manila. Um, and Anthony turned to me and said, hey, man, I'm thinking of starting this business. I currently work on it on the weekends. I work for my dad on the weekdays. It's kind of like a hobby business. Uh, would you like to buy one third of my hobby business for a million US dollars. Uh, and, and you know, that and that was that would have been buying one third of grab at a million US dollars. And that was probably that flight to Manila was something like eight years ago. And I said, I go, oh my God. Sounds like the most expensive the most expensive flight you ever took. <laughs> right. I was gonna say if, I, if we had closed that deal, I could have probably could have bought every airline and every plane in the Philippines. Um, you know, and then there's another moment where you know I met William from Tokopedia. I don't know, nine years ago. And he was like, hey, Patrick, um, I've seen what you've done with iProperty. Will you buy 25% of Tokopedia for $5 million, right? So, and you know, today this is a, an amazing $7 billion company and 25% would have been one point, whatever, 5 billion. So, so we've come across these great opportunities. And the thing is that, you know, we made this conscious decision not to be a VC, right? Which means that we generally don't take minority stakes. We generally don't, um, I guess like, we, 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 we don't take a wide approach, right? We, we decided to take a niche approach because I think what we decided is that, you know, let's stick to things that we know intimately well. Let's stick to businesses where we will join boards, we'll work with the entrepreneurs, we'll help them grow their businesses and, and let's try to give as much face time as we can. But I think Kylie's approach, and, you know, and to Kylie's credit, he's, he's backed and found three unicorns, at least in Southeast Asia, when these companies were, you know, Series A or even before Series A, and, and found these companies. But I think it also comes down to, you know, the, that 500 is taking this wide approach. And so I think my question to Kylie is being, hey, you found these companies. Do you sometimes sit there and, and go, you know what, I backed too many companies. Would I be better off giving more money to Grab, giving more money to Bukalapak and giving less money to like a hundred other companies? Like, did you ever think about that? I think it's a point of re reflection. I, I'll tell you about the probably more um, sciencey approach when I think about this, and then the, the other one is a bit more subjective. So, on the sciencey approach, like in the years that came, right, like we 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 try to rebalance our portfolio and kind of like a, a review, kind of what went right, what went wrong, um, and we also because we've got a lot all the numbers and cap tables of all these companies, we just simulate. Have we done this? Have we done that? How does it affect the fund returns? Right. So when we do that, um, I, I I mean, there's always ways you can look back words and kind of feel, oh, we, we could have, we, we, we could have like put more here and there, but we're very disciplined with the thesis because we don't want um, portfolio concentration, which you don't want to put too much money on a single one company because that messes with, with, with our approach. So I think one of the, and they brought this up.
approach. So you can, by being very disciplined with your approach, you kind of sometimes have to lose certain opportunities or say no to certain opportunities, or maybe like not overextend yourself into certain opportunities. But in the long run, you get to see whether your approach works. And for 500, like our approach isn't just about making money. I think one of the drivers uh, of why I decided to go into investing in the first place, because I didn't just jump right into 500. What after, after um, um, Groupon and after says, um, I did a lot of angel investing. You know, I, uh, I angel invested in companies like iMoney, for example, or, or and I went, went, went in my time in Silicon Valley, I invested in a bunch of companies there. And in, in, in the angel investing, like I did it because it was fun. I did it because I, I believed in those ideas and I believe those ideas would create a ton of impact. Uh, and I thought that if I can have fun and have impact, then maybe I'll make money. I thought that would be great. So I think venture capital is very similar because like, I felt that um, it would be, uh, it, I could create a lot of impact by doing what I was doing. And it could also be very fun to actually learn and grow with people rather than the solitary solitary journey of being like a founder where, where maybe you and your co-founder are just learning together. I thought I could learn with a larger community. And um, so I think on those subjective uh, basis, like I think it's been very successful to be able to be part a lot of not just the successes of companies like Grab, Bukalapa, you know, Carousel, and so and so forth, but also to kind of see the trials and tribulations along the way. One last thing I'd say about that, though, is that it's very difficult uh, whether a company is going to be wildly successful between companies, like uh, after it's like seed funded in the first like one year, maybe even up to five years, like you'll see the company come so close to having no money whatsoever. And, and you know, you know, you know this feeling, Patrick, like it's like there's existential threats every step of the way for a lot of them. And so they're like, so the graph goes like this, like, oh, I'm so optimistic. It's going to be huge. And then, oh, I'm going to die. Oh, this is a little, 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 it's up and down and it goes crazy. And then, then suddenly there's an exit event or a significant funding event or a certain milestone where like, oh, okay, you know, and then there's some sense of normalcy or for, for now, right? And, and so I, I, it's very difficult to know what would be successful. Even though, um, like the C companies that I, I've, I've led and invested in, so many of them have become unicorns and such. Like, you don't know whether they're going to continue their extension. You know, we don't know that per se. Until they go IPO and somebody buys them, then the money comes back around, right? So although I've been a VC for seven years, which is longer than I've been an entrepreneur now, until 10 years, I think, is the, is the finish line for any of these funds, for most of these funds. So after I clock in 10 years, I'll tell you whether it's been quote-unquote successful from the financial sense. Impact and the growth, the, the ecosystem that I feel that I derive from, that's like, a, I feel that's successful. I feel good about it. Mm -hmm. Hey, Kylie, can I, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to know because yes, I, I, I'm like, I'm a huge fan of yours. I love your energy. I love your internet. Like, like we, you and I brainstormed in probably three different countries in the last two years. And, and I, and every time we brainstorm together, I come out of it just learning so much more. And I, I never told you this, but every time when I was brainstorming with you, my, my, my secret, my secret agenda was to convince you to leave 500 and become an entrepreneur. <laughs> and, and, and so I've always wanted <laughs> I wanted to get you so passionate about an idea where you go, shit, I should just do this. So I've always wondered, like, do you ever sit there and go, hey, you know what? Like, like I, I, I could do this. I could do this again. I could go back for round two. I, I could be an entrepreneur, start a company, put a deck, look for a guy like Kylie to give me 100K. Like, do you ever sit there and think, hey, maybe I should one day just go back to being an entrepreneur? Because when I see the qualities that you have, like, like you are an amazing entrepreneur. Like, I would back you in a heartbeat. So I kind of think, do you ever wonder... Hey, what if, what if, what if I, I decided to pivot and go back to being an entrepreneur? Uh, I appreciate your kind words. Uh, and I'm going to return you a similar question after this, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I, I would say that like, I, I, I am familiar with that. And I think that someone like yourself, who is an entrepreneur, who gets a lot of, uh, interested investors, um, that, that is a question that, yeah, that, I mean, that, I've come across that before that question before. It's, it's not a question that I, I mean, I'm just open. It's not a question that I, I completely say, oh, you know, moments like in time where like, hmm, also like, as well, 
watching so much movies, such a great company, there are moments where I can ask myself, hey, you know, could I have done that? Like, if let's say I was in a VC and I kind of put my founder gloves on, could I have stepped back in the ring and could I kind of like build a big company? Um, but I'll tell you that, like, I think it's important to face those questions, whatever doubts and, and, and the questions you have inside. And, and I, I face them and uh, I journal similar, like, inspiration from you because I think you've been a big proponent of journaling. I journal and I ask myself, like, why do you feel that way? And I don't feel like this all the time. It's maybe like 0.2% of the time. But I realized that sometimes like the impetus for me to want to build a company, why? Why would I want to do it? Number one, like for me, I felt that it was out of a sense of self-worth, you know? Like, do I feel that I'm less than somebody else because I'm not a unicorn founder, right? So when I really confront the question, I don't, you know? I feel great. I feel, I feel, like, I feel, like, it's, I feel like I love my life and I've had such a crazy journey. Like I've traveled to so many countries. I've worked with all kinds of people and I get, and I deal with like, it's not just the founders because I deal a lot with my investors who invest in my funds. And, and I have like some serious investors, the top families, you know, family offices and tycoons from around the world I had to learn with, you know, and I'm, I'm not here in the name drop, but like every, like so many people that I admire and like I want to learn from, I face to face heartfelt conversations with them. And uh, as a result of this job and, um, and also what I didn't expect is that I would also be invited to own a piece of 500 along the way. And so now uh, I'm on the board of 500 as a group. I work with uh, the rest of the managing partners and the founders, and all of us have this executive team where we steer the organization. Um, and so overseeing that responsibility on how do we kind of stay on course with our mission, even though there are like temptations or distractions along the way, uh, mirror the conversation that you asked me, that some of the e to have along the way that she start a company or people try to throw me money to do something or getting momentarily infatuated with a certain idea, that can be distractions on my original mission. And so my kind of short answer to that is that like, it's not so much like we feel like we want to do something else. Just ask why do we feel like doing something else? And then when we look at those reasons, are they good enough reasons? And for me, the answer is never a yes. Like 500 is such a unique gig. It's like, I, I, I can't think of anything else. Like someone has, someone has told me once, it's Kylie, like what you're doing at 500, it's like the one belt, one road of the new economy. You know, you're wiring up capital and connections in 76 countries, 2,004 startups. It's, it's so powerful. It's so interesting. And so for me, like, I think that te- like there is still so much that I haven't done with 500. And so every time I come back to it, I'm like, every day is new. Every day founders come along with these new crazy ideas. It's new. You know, I feel like I'm at the front seat of the world changing. And now more than ever before, I'm like need entrepreneurs to work. And if I spend time on one idea, it's like it also it kind of negates the ability to kind of activate like hundreds more entrepreneurs. So even though like I activate them in very small ways and the journey is theirs, is that I think we need to solve things industry-wide, collaborating with corporations, governments, if, if entrepreneurs. It's, it's not just about the startup scene on its own anymore. Like the tech startup scene exists in the larger economy, and it's about time like we actually use the skills we have to collaborate with many more people to solve global problems so to me like seeing that ahead for the next 10 years is just um is something that just is always on my mind so that's on my mind 99.99 percent of the time right so i i know it's a bit of a long-winded answer but i thought i just <laughs> take you to a romp through my head <laughs> yeah I think about it but hey back to, oh back to you pat like i mean you 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 we have conversations about this you wanted to you're thinking that oh man building places these companies so hard so there's some moments where like if i were an investor i wouldn't need to face all that hardships all of the freaking time it wouldn't be on my shoulders you know so are there moments that you feel you want to quote unquote tap out or like you know take a side seat or be on the bench like how, how do you navigate those thoughts i'm sure a lot of founders yeah, who are I mean, tuning I mean, into this you know the they time, have right, I mean, thoughts I mean, too. you should always I mean, you're always debating with yourself, right, to get to a better answer, and then that, 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 you know that's why I journal a lot because it's it's that it's that form or that ring where I can fight with myself to get to a, a better conclusion. But I mean, completely. And and I and I you know I did the math. If I if I had led a Series A, if I had become a VC, um, and led a Series A and Grab and Toko Peter, I would be significantly financially better off than I am today, right? So, so, I, so I've clearly chosen the path that isn't as financially rewarding. But I mean, back to what you said in the end of the day, like I've chosen the path that's right for me, 
right? And and I don't and I and I and what you do and the way you think about it is absolutely amazing, amazing. But for me to have to back five hundred entrepreneurs and and not give them the face time that I want to give them to not be intimately involved in those details, like that wouldn't work for my DNA and my personality. I like to roll up my sleeves yeah. and get deep into it, involved in a business. So when I look at the number of businesses that we're involved in at any one time, you know, it's anywhere from five to 10 and, and we get deep, we get involved. And I think another way that we think about it is like, you know, we don't at catch it. We don't have LPs. We don't have investors. It, it is, it is the money of, of myself and my partner, Luke. And, and so when, when you, when it, when it is your own money that you invest in companies, you, you, you probably, you probably think about it a little bit differently. Whereas when you're, when you have LPs, right, you somewhat have to take a diversified approach because you do want to make gains but you don't want to lose the money. Was we we take approach to that? Look, if we believe in something, and we put the money in. Look, um, if we lose that money, we're only responsible to ourselves. We don't. We're not responsible to LPs or anyone else. And and so I think we take a different concentrated approach. And kind of when I look at what we are now, you know, it was it was I was journaling and and, and I reflected that in my twenties. So I'm I'm almost forty five now. So I'm old for the internet world, but in my 20s, you know, I was a single entrepreneur. You know, we were just focused on building one business. We'd pivot, we'd evolve, we'd pivot, we evolve. We were very, very focused on building one business. And then when I hit our 30s, you know, we became serial entrepreneurs. We built one business, it got a bit of traction. Then we thought, okay, let's try and spin out another business. And we spun out another business. And, you know, that's where we did a whole series of IPOs. And I realized that as we hit our 40s, that that I don't want to be a, a single entrepreneur and I don't want to be a serial entrepreneur. I actually want to be the backer of other great entrepreneurs like like i've realized that you know the the entrepreneur journey is amazing and i've also realized that a business built by an entrepreneur versus a non-entrepreneur more often than not you, you know it, it's it's you're going to get a different result and and i look kind of what we want to do going forward it's it's backing great entrepreneurs so it's kind of similar to what 500 does but i think where we differ is that we just want to back five or ten whereas you guys want to back as many as possible yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. You brought that up. Kind of like the the expression of your quote through the different phases of your life, right? And I think that a lot of folks tuning into yeah. Wild Digital, you know, they're tuning in here not because they they not only because they want to learn about the like the future of insure tech, for example, right? I think a lot of folks are also figuring out for their own careers. Like, if they're an entrepreneur, where do I take my company? If I'm like working in a corporate or whatever, should I be an entrepreneur? Should I be a VC? Should I, how do I even go into these things, right? And some folks who are maybe out of a job right now, right? And in between and in the next gig, I think this is very useful reflection um, where you have the dimension of age. And for me, I tell you, I grapple with this sometimes, you know, I, uh, like, uh, when I turned 30, I felt that everyone, like, we were talking about midlife crisis, you know, I, I life renaissance, you know, but I was like mortally confused. Um, that I get this personal dimension. Um, I think, Patrick, you've got a kid, you know, congratulations on that. Like along the past 10 years, I also got married, you know, I turned vegan, you know, I've been vegan for more than four years with my wife. Um, we've done, we've, we've leaned a lot of our weekends into charity, into like um, social impact causes, you know, and, 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 and spending time on those things. Um, I think the personal dimension of also wanting to uh, build strong foundations for health. You know, I think both you and I also care about health. Um, you know, we, we experiment with fasting. Like for me, like I, 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 as far as not just veganism, but also like consistent working out, um, dieting, eating well, sleeping, you know, I'm trying to get, get good sleep. I think that I, I start to realize that like, I can get a lot of the world. And as my cool. 20s, I don't have to destroy sleep. I don't have to destroy health, right? And so you kind of, I think that dimension is also important for anyone figuring out their careers and how they want to express their craft. Um, yeah, you know, and so maybe I want to ask you, like, you've become a father now, right? Like, uh, do you think that influences some of your decisions or, you know, and how, how you want to approach your next 10 years of Patrick Grove and Katja? Yeah, <laughs> completely, right? Because you start to realize that you can't work 24 hours a day. So when you're 20s, you know, you might work three days with no sleep. So, so yeah, I think as, as a father, you, you and, and you realize that you're not invincible, but at the same time, you do want to reweight your time and, and spend more time with, you, with your, your family and kids. So, Kyla, we got 40, kind of eight seconds, a so quick one. What's your forecast or what's your big dream for the Southeast Asian tech scene in the next five years? Uh, yeah, I think... Number one is like my big, you know, it's not, yeah, okay. So I, I, I think that the, the world will, will pull a lot of startups back to its original intent of solving huge problems. I think that the startup ecosystem has somewhat took a sidestep into just chasing 
money, profit, raising big rounds, a lot of ego thumping, a lot of like businesses that people are going in because it's fun, it's trendy, it's cool, you know? But I think there are like huge problems to be solved and the weight of the world will hopefully recenter that gravity. So that's just one big prediction of mine. Uh, yeah. How about yours, man? What's your prediction, dude? Next 10 years. No, my, 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 mine is very simple. Look, I, I, want, I want Southeast Asia to build a massive unicorn that goes global. You know, I think we've built great companies that are like Indonesia focused or Southeast Asia focused. And, and you know, you see a lot of investors saying, oh, I'm coming to, I'm coming to invest in Indonesia. So it's, so it's not even about the entrepreneur or the idea. It's just about they just want to back a country with 300 million people. Whereas, you know, I hope that at some point in the next five years, this part of the world builds a company that truly goes global and puts Southeast yeah. Asia on the map. And, and, I would, and I would love to be part of that journey. Yeah, and, yeah, and so yeah, look, yeah. that's my big crazy goal yeah. for Southeast Asia. We're not just we're not just a geographical play box yeah, for yeah. global VCs. We actually are a global hotbed of ideas and innovation. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think on that note, just extend maybe another 10 seconds on that note. Like I also want to predict like there's new generation of faces and talent to um to activate the ecosystem in different ways. You know, like uh, at, at 500, for example, I'm not the only person running around cutting checks and do these things. You know, we're, we're building large teams in, in different parts of the world. Like we're hiring for seven simultaneous positions, you know, and, and we want to build machinery and infrastructure and, and have a next generation, a next generation of really passionate folks who want to build up the ecosystem and who want to continue to do the good work and actually create a lot of impact and, and hopefully see other ecosystems like Pakistan, you know, like um, right now we're doing some, some work in Africa as well, right? To try to see some of those things get activated as well. So I think with that in mind, it's, it's similar, right? Like we're trying to build more global impact into more parts All of the world. All right. And, uh, and you, you'll you be part of that in some way. Sharing. I'll be part of that in I'm some way. I'm afraid we are running on a tight schedule. Good. Hey, it's all good, man. It's all good. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, everyone. You're doing good.